Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel. And I'm Kate Humble and we're on the Grand Staircase here at Longleat House. Last year, over 300,000 visitors came to visit the ancestral home of the Marquis of Bath and to see the fabulous treasures that it contains. We'll be bringing you stories from the house, the safari park and the estate throughout the series. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. Mum goes ballistic when it's time to give the youngest cub her injections. Down in Pet's Corner, the otters have had babies and Darren is bursting to spread the news. You can tell by the big cheesy grin, can't you? It either means I won the lottery or there's something even better. But it's a different story for Babs, the elderly rhino. She's taken a turn for the worse. She's lost a lot of strength in her back legs. So much so that she kind of collapses, she you know, does that frequently. You know, that's going to be pretty painful and uh, pretty distressing for her, I think. But now we're going up to the lion house where last month Luna gave birth to three cubs. Sadly, two of them were found dead within the first couple of days. It's not unusual. In the wild, only one in five cubs survive into adulthood. And this was Luna's first litter. But she still has one. It's a little girl, and this was always the strongest cub. She's now six weeks old, and keeper Bob Trollop is delighted with her progress. As you can see, Cubby, which we haven't got a name for yet, is... Uh... Getting bigger. Mum's as grumpy as ever, which is really good because, you know, that's what you want her to be doing. You want her to sort of see us off every time we come in, um, which is really good. You know, she's doing everything that we would expect her to do. She's getting fond of her voice a little bit more now. Um, to tell you the truth, to start with, she's a little bit slow on the uptake. Um, when we were moving, moving them from pen to pen just so we could tidy up, she has this problem with following mum. <laughs> she doesn't want to do it. It's only a few occasions we've had to sort of go in there and pick her up and put her in. Which uh, is fine when they're small, but when they start to get a bit more adventurous and their teeth and claws are getting a bit sharper, it's, <laughs> it's not so, so nice. It may not be nice, but today it's got to be done. The time has come for the cub to be given the first round of her inoculations. Just like our domestic cats, these lions need protection against a number of killer diseases. Vet Duncan Williams is here to give the injection, while Craig Faggeter is the keeper who's been volunteered to go in first. He knows what to do. Basically, just go in there, don't hesitate, and just grab it. And you just make sure you don't get your hands caught. Hands in the way from the uh, sharp end. <laughs> they can turn on you quite quickly, so you've got to make sure you've got a good grip. If you haven't, you are going to get hurt. Now Duncan can give the injection. This one's for cat flu, which is particularly dangerous to the very young. We will have to repeat it in a couple of weeks' time, just the same as you do with an, uh, an ordinary kitten so it, you know, boosts the immunity. The cub also needs a dose of worming solution. The cub doesn't seem too upset, but mum is furious. However, the whole operation is over in less than a minute, so Luna can be let back with her baby in no time. Brian Kent, the keeper in charge, is very happy with how she's behaved. Luna's a um, very good mum, yeah. Um, Doing everything well, looking after the cub brilliantly, no problem. She's bound to be a bit stressed because you get her up from the uh, her cub, so, you know, it's going to be like that, but, you know, we do it as quick as we can. At the moment, the whole family is being kept separately, but in adjacent pens. With the cub so young, it could be dangerous to let Kabir, the father, get too close. Brian reckons this arrangement is fine with him. Dad, he's a bit of a wuss. I think cub comes running up and he'll run off. So I don't know why, but uh, I don't know. Typical male, I suppose. 
On the other side of Kabir is the other female of his pride, Yendi, who is Luna's sister. She also has a new club, though this one is two months older. She's another girl and has been named Malaika, which means angel in Swahili. Soon the time will come to unite the whole family, though Bob knows that that could be a difficult day. Really and truly, the first time they go there is, I always think, is the worst time for us because you don't know what's going to happen. There's always that possibility that they might get in the way of a bit of a scuffle or whatever and get hurt. Um, and that's always the worst time. You know, once they've been out for a few times and they know their little escape routes and where they've got to run to, they'll be fine. It's all part of the, the learning process, isn't it? You know, I, I, I should imagine Mum Luna will be very good at protecting them. Later in the series, we'll be there to see what happens when the family meet for the first time out in the open. But for now, Bob is in no rush for his new babies to grow up too fast. This is great for you know, I, I love coming in here and just watching the cubs. Um, and to have a, a nice little family unit, this is a new pride starting. And, you know, what we set out to do. Kabir has come in, he's done his stuff, he's, you know, he's proven himself. Um, and let's hope we can have many more cubs. It's been a number of years now since Longleat's herd of pygmy goats had any kids. The problem is that there's no red-blooded male here. So, a few months ago, arrangements were made to borrow a billy. His name was John Joe. He came from Glamorgan, and he's every inch a stud. After two short weeks of unbridled passion, it was time for John Joe to move on to pastures new. Now I've come to meet senior keeper Bev Evans to find out about the consequences. So obviously you're looking for distended bellies, yes. which a few of them, <laughs> especially that one there. Yes, Ali is slightly, yeah, round. And um, are there any other signs that you can have a look for? Um, change in behaviour, yep. eating more, quieting down a little bit more, um, the udder, the teats underneath getting a bit more enlarged, that right. kind of thing. So does that mean that they're all girls in here? Um, no, we have seven girls, but we have our three boys as well. Right. Um, so Papa Dom just here, Charlie yep. and Cracker just behind oh, us just behind here. behind us here. They're castrated males. Okay. Um, about six years ago we decided to stop breeding here at Longleats um, just because our numbers were just getting at, um, just too much. Right. Um, so, but since then um, we've decided, you know, we've only got ten we'll just, um, and they're getting older. So we'll just uh, increase the numbers a bit. So potentially how many, um, how many could each goat have if they um, were pregnant? Right. Normally it's a single one, but twins is not uncommon, and sometimes triplets as well. So really? say, you know, seven females, we could have at least 14 kids here. <laughs> Which, <laughs> added to the 10 you've already got, yes. could bring you up to 24 or so. <laughs> That's a lot of pygmy goats. it's a lot of goats. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have to ask about the colours. Obviously there's a complete mix here. Yep. We've got the white ones and the darker ones and the speckled ones. Will you have a complete variety of colours once um, again? We hope so. The billy goat we brought in, John Joe, he's a tri-coloured, um, and hopefully um, genetically, he'll be able to throw us a few colours, yeah, definitely. So if you haven't done this for six years, yes. is this a whole new thing for you in particular? Yes, yeah, sure, it is, yeah. Um, but we're, I'm hoping it'll go fine. Um, they, they, they normally have a, a very good natural birth. Mm -hmm. There has been things in the past where, you know, emergency caesareans are needed just because of their small frame, really. Right. But what we've tried to do is keep their weight off so the baby's quite small, so hopefully it should, be, right. should go fine. And will you have to adapt their diet at all? Will you have to to do things yeah. when, when we find out if they really are pregnant or not? Um, we'll, we'll hopefully find out soon if, if they are really um, pregnant or not. Um, and then probably just up their diet just before, mm -hmm. um, some, some concentrated nuts and things like that. And also certainly afterwards when they're lactating as well. And what is the gestation period for a goat? It's only five months, so it's not, not long at all. OK. Do you think there's any likelihood that you may have to hand rear any of them? Um, Possibly, if they have like one has triplets, mm -hmm. um, you might have to supplement the third um, baby. So um, yeah, possibly, but we would like not to really, to be honest. Of course, leave it all natural. Very true. Fingers crossed, it all goes well, Thank you. and uh, of course, we'll keep you posted on the progress of the pygmy goats.
Last year, in Pet's Corner, Romeo was brought in as a new mate for Rosie, the Asian short-clawed otter. Now, something wonderful has happened, and the keeper in charge, Darren Beasley, is over the moon. Some great news down here at Pet's Corner. You can tell by the big cheesy grin, can't you? It either means I won the lottery or there's something even better. Um, after, I don't know, over 30 years of, of waiting, we have at last got some baby otters again in Pet's Corner. In fact, Mum and Dad have just poked their head out. I bet you can't see. They've just come out to see. They've obviously heard her voice. This is really great news, because what's been happening is Dad's been... Little Romeo's been taking the food into Mum. And she's been looking after the baby. She's been in there nursing them, giving them milk. Uh, and now I'm so excited. They've both started coming out for some food, which means that the babies are hopefully developing nicely and they feel braver enough to, to leave them. Despite Darren's excitement, the truth is that no one has actually seen the otter pups yet. They don't even know how many there are. Otters are born blind and the parents keep them safely tucked away inside the den for the first few weeks of life. The keepers mustn't disturb the babies because if they're contaminated with human sense, it could cause the parents to abandon or even kill the pups. So Rob Savin needs to be very careful when he cleans the house. We think there might be three because it's just a really an, a, a, an educated guess. Um, they're supposed to have between two and six young. Uh, it has been known for them to have seven at one time, um, but it's normal for them to have three or four. In the hope of getting a first peek at the new babies, Darren strapped his camcorder to a beam overlooking the den. He turned it on and then left it to record to the end of the tape. It's a hit and miss method and the red colour is from the heat lamp that keeps the place cosy. The problem is we don't actually want to go in there with them and disturb them because we, we, they're so precious. We don't want mum and dad running off and leaving them and uh, not giving them any milk. This is a, a big breakthrough. I so say we've waited 30 years to have baby otters here again. Um, and I'm, I'm so proud and chuffed that it's happened, but uh, I would love to know how many are down in there. Not, not a great deal of movement going on. We might just have to let the camera carry on running and put it in, but I'll have to watch it on fast forward because uh, four hours of a board and a, a nice warm night house is not exactly uh, prime time evening viewing for me. In fact, Darren's spy camera never did catch any sneak previews and everyone just had to wait. We'll be back later when Rosie and Romeo are ready to show us the first baby otters at Longleat in over 30 years. While Longleat is famous for its exotic species, there are also plenty of more familiar animals here. The estate includes a number of working farms and for centuries the open parkland has been grazed by sheep. Right now the farmers are getting ready for the lambing season. We're out in the park with sheep farmers Simon Baggs and Steve Crossman and uh, you've gathered all the sheep in here, Simon. Yeah. Um, what's the plan today? Uh, the plan is we're going to take the triplets out and take them back down to the other farm and leave the singles and the twins here. Okay. But they're all adults. What do you mean triplets? Yeah, well, sorry, sorry, we have them scanned in January. Right. And the, the triplets are green, marked yeah. green on their backs. Um, the twins are blue. Right. And the singles are red. So these are all expectant ewes. Yes. You know exactly yeah. what's, what's in, in, yeah. All, yeah. in all of them. Yeah. So what do we need to do now to uh, if help? You, if Steve and uh, Ben go down the bottom okay. to the other pen, and then we could, if they bring them up and we'll yeah. sort them out. OK. okay. So we're going right. to basically herd them. Yeah, bring them back up. All right, right. go and be yeah. like a sheep we'll dog. <laughs> OK. So, um, so Steve, what, what does, how, presumably we're going to use all of the different gates that are here to... Um, to sh sort of shuffle them through. Yeah, we'll go on through into this gate in a minute here. OK, have you any idea how many are in here? This must be a couple oh, of hundred. You, yeah, I would say there's a couple of hundred in here at least. OK. Yeah. Obviously, they've all been scanned, and that yeah. basically involves... It's like a, a woman that's pregnant, is it? Exactly, just, just exactly the same. It's an ultra scan. Yeah. Uh, they come in, they've got a specialist um, uh, a crate set up that right. they run through. The chap sits in there, he scans the sheep. Yep. And he then marks them according to what's inside them. So that's the colours. The sheep that have um, triplets are coloured... Green. Green. Blue is twins and red are singles. Right. Presumably they're expecting relatively yeah. We don't really want to put them under too much stress. We'll just okay. walk around nice and quiet. Yep. 
and then hopefully that gate will be up there nicely. That's right. And then we'll just. Where the others will be um, be waiting to yeah. um, to separate them. All we got to do is just quietly move up behind them, right, and make sure they go up in. Fantastic. Okay, Simon. So this one's going back out into That's the park, right, yeah, and in the that park. one. All the all the reds and blues go out, out there. Right. Because the blues are the twins, and the reds are the singles. Okay. So why is it only the triplets that you're taking out? Oh, here's a green coming. Oh yeah, my word! One. So I've got to change the gate really quickly. Over, back again. <laughs> and again. Because <laughs> that one's a black, and that okay, one's not in lamb. One. Okay. So then, yeah, basically. It's we're quite stressful. This. It is. Yeah. Basically, we're bringing them in the triplets because obviously we lamb outside. Right. So it's better to have them in because we can foster on. Uh, to use, I've, I've only got one. Oh, OK, so you won't allow one sheep to look after three, well, there's a green... You, you, can, you can do, but it's better to, if, you know, if you've got some singles, it's better to let the, you, know, you have another lamb and have twins on her. Right. And, and presumably it's better for the lambs too, yes. is it? Yeah, that's right, because the ewe's only got two udders. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's, um, it's better to... That's a blue. It's better to... Here's a green a coming, green coming. coming. Go on. Oh! <laughs> oh, go on. Go on, go on. That's it, well done. Got it. Well done. Yep. Yeah. Can't see any more no, greens. No more green. Oh, here's one coming now. OK. That's it. Here you go. OK. That's a lot. That's a lot. Wow. Whew. Good bit of sorting. So now, all we've got to do... Is load them into the yeah, trailer. Yeah, load them into the trailer and we'll take them and to the other them farm. Up to the farm. Yeah. Well, Simon, thank you very much okay. for letting us help. Good job, Steve. And ben. Thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much for filtering them through. Sure, and um, let's hope that the lambing season goes very well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. While for many of the animals of Longleat, new life is on the way, for others, it's a different story. Babs, the white rhino, is getting on. In fact, at 37, she's one of the oldest rhinos in the country. The years have caught up with her, and as well as suffering from an uncomfortable skin complaint, she's also plagued by arthritis. It's getting worse and is now causing great pain. Vet Duncan Williams has been monitoring her condition, and what he saw a couple of weeks ago was not encouraging. Babs, are you going to come and say hello? Hey? Oh, there you go, darling. She doesn't look very steady at all. She looks very weak. It's when she very... turns. Yeah. When she twists, she's certainly in the in middle of the week. She was actually collapsing. She was actually bang. She was hitting the deck. We're doing everything we can. We're nursing her through it, aren't we? We're looking after her best we can. We're not, you know... We're making her life as comfortable as possible and supplement her, try and prevent the arthritis from becoming too serious and just keeping a close eye on her. It's been a long road for Babs. She was born in 1969 out in the open bush of South Africa. She came to Britain as a youngster and arrived here at Longleat 13 years ago. She was always even-tempered and good-natured, so in recent times when the three new youngsters arrived from Africa, she fell right into the role of protective grandma to help them settle in. But the most unique thing about Babs is how much she enjoys contact with her keepers. For Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner, that's something really special. You're feeling old, aren't you, sweetheart? That's the trouble. And she's got tender bits by her on the skin, see? It's just where she's getting a bit... The uh, senior citizen age is coming in, I'm afraid. I mean, normally, all this sort of stuff she likes. You see, she's flinching there, aren't you? And normally, you, as soon as you call her, she'll come over. And there's a couple of days where she's not even bothered to come over. And that's, all, that's the signs that keepers look for, which the vet can't see. He can see if she's looking ill, with signs of illness, but it's, it's when she's not being a normal cell. But now Babs has taken a turn for the worse. Today, Duncan the vet was called and he's found her condition badly deteriorated. She just basically hasn't been herself. She's been very dull, very slow. Her skin, she's got lots of multiple infections, but the main thing that we've found is she's lost a lot of strength in her back legs, so much so that she kind of collapses, she you know, does that frequently, especially if she's turning, she's turning sharp. It's the sort of thing we can't really let her go on and on and on because 
We don't want to come in and find a collapse totally in suffering. There's now only one way to free Babs from pain. Duncan has just left head warden Keith Harris. They had a very difficult decision to make. It's got to the stage now where she's actually struggling to walk and she struggles to get up in the morning. Um, so she can't go out with the other rhinos. And, you know, she does, you can, you can see she gets upset when the others go out without her. Um, and it, it's, we've been able to control the pain up to now, but we don't feel that um, we can keep doing this because the, the, the pain seems to be outstripping the, the painkillers. Each day, obviously, through the keepers, we've been monitoring her closely. And then on Duncan's visits, um, we've been, again, watching her closely. Um, and we've just had a, a, a meeting together. Um, and I think it's collectively thought that, really, she's, she's had enough now. Um, and we've had to take the decision to um, euthanise her today. At the end of the day, we can't treat old age, I'm afraid. It comes to us all. So um, the, the, I think one of the biggest criteria we try to, to take is, is quality of life. We could be selfish and keep her going for, for our wants and needs. Um, and we, we have to try and banish those thoughts. Um, and it is very hard, but I think at the end of the day, you know, we can say that we've given her a very good life. Duncan has been the Safari Park vet for eight years, and in that time, he's made countless visits to the Rhino House. Today will be the last call he'll make on Babs. Earlier this week, I, I popped in and um, she had two massive grazes on her, on her flank where I think she must have fallen in the night, fallen against the bars. And, you know, that's got to be pretty painful and, and pretty distressing for her, I think. Really, the bottom line is we don't want her to suffer, so that's why we've made the decision. So now to carry out that decision. Babs will be sedated with a dart, then Duncan will be able to administer a painless overdose of anaesthetic. Well, the, the main danger really is you know, using the Immobilon um, because it's very dangerous to humans. The rhino skin is, in parts, it's, it's almost two inches thick and it's very difficult to, to inject and dart. We should have no trouble getting that into it with a, a, a dart gun, which would be powerful enough to fire through, but we just need a very long needle. But the hardest job falls to Tim Yeo, the keeper in charge of the rhinos. He's been caring for Babs for the last 13 years. Now he must fire the sedative dart that will send her off to sleep. It's not a very nice thing to be doing, but uh, but it's um, you know it's, it's got to be done. I think you've got to go and do something positively and as professionally as you can. But you, you don't want to do it. You know you don't you don't, you don't want to do this at all. However much you as a person dislike. This is the worst bit of the job. The team can't put it off any longer. They must do what's best for Babs. We'll be back in the Rhino House a little later on. Of all the world's mammals, almost half of the species are nocturnal. Bats, for example, come out mainly at night. So to keep Longleat's 15 Egyptian fruit bats happy, they live in an artificial cave that's usually nice and dark, except when it's time for us to do some work in there. I've come down to the bat cave with an important delivery for keeper Joe Hawthorne. Hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. Now, you're doing an experiment with the bats, is that right? I am. I'm doing an experiment um, as part of my coursework at college right. um, to identify exactly which foods that the bats prefer. OK, and presumably the simple way to do that is to put it up. It is, <laughs> exactly. On here, basically, we've got um, all their favourite food. Right, um, which is a mixture of We've apples. got the cantaloupe melon, we've got the banana. So um, do we just slide them on yeah, here? Yeah, just slide them on the hooks here. So what's your course? What, what does that involve? Um, it's, it's basically um, coursework over the period of two years, but 
you know, kind of studying different species, and of course, bats are my favourites. So. I know, <laughs> I know. They, you, you have a bit of a weakness, don't you? I do. So any any excuse, you know, to do anything on, on the bat side, then that's what I've been doing. So now, do we just leave this here? Yeah, we just leave that here. Right. Um, and what we need to do is actually probably pull it up a little bit. Okay, shall, I, shall, shall yeah. I do that? If you keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Yep, about there. That's okay. fine. I noticed that there was actually a piece of a big piece of melon. A lovely there. piece here of honeydew melon. Oh, I, so, do have a, um, I have a weakness for honeydew. <laughs> where, where are we going to put that? If we go and put that on over here, okay. on, on the platform over here. Right. Um, so and then, yeah, you can take that. And then hopefully, we have some very keen members that actually prefer this. Where, where shall I put it? This one here. Just put it here. Yeah. Okay. And the um, idea is that they'll... Um, we'll just, just let them do their thing, step back, um, and hopefully the ones that have got this passion for it will come down and uh, have a feed. So they're, they're, they're obviously just hanging back a little bit. Are we, are we kind of scaring them off no, by being No, they'll, they'll take a while. There you go. Oh, look, they're, they're just waiting to see that we've finished hanging it up. You can see the tongue, actually, yeah. the one with its little face. That, that's for extracting um, nectar in it's the wild, and it'll actually extract nectar with that tongue. They've so. actually got very sweet little faces they are, when you lovely. see it like that. They really are. They're gorgeous. They are the nicer looking of all the bats, you know. They're, hence why they're called flying foxes. They have a little fox-like feature there with the long nose and the muzzle, the little round eyes there. And lovely. these incredible wings. So that bat on there is actually using its wing to kind of clasp onto that They've fruit as well. They've got two hooks on the, on the kind of forebit of their um, wing there. And you can see that they're really rather long. Mm -hmm. They'll use those for climbing right. um, and use them for, you know, attaching on kind of precarious positions like that. They don't mind all eating together, do no, they? No, no, not at all. It's a bit of kind of who gets the canteen first, you oh, know, right. helps themselves, so. <laughs> That's great. Messy eaters. Oh, look, we've got one over here now. Ah, there you go. Look at how he's sort of holding his, he will, his wing yeah. around the whole thing. Once they've found something, you know, it's like you and me. If you find something you really like, um, it's kind of, it's mine, you know. Um, you see his ears going there all they're, the time. They're moving all over the place. Listening, What's that? Listening out for all the other sounds. They, you know, bats rely on their, sound, on their hearing more mm -hmm. than anything else. So he's listening out for the others, you know, are they coming to get my piece of melon? Right. Um, but no matter what they're doing, whether they're hanging up, you know, eating, feeding, wherever they are, their ears are just going constantly. Absolutely fascinating, <laughs> Joe. Thank you very much. That's I think all right. we should leave them to their fruit salad. <laughs>For over four centuries, Lord Bath's family has been filling Longleat House with all kinds of treasure. Amongst the lavish trappings of great wealth, there's fine art and exquisite antiques. Many of these are not only priceless, but also quite extraordinary. When we left Longleat last year, this display case was empty, waiting for its display. I'm here with Claire Mound, a head guide here at Longleat, and um, it is a magnificent display, Isn't Claire. It wonderful? It really okay. is. So tell me about these, these pieces. These pieces were made for Augustus uh, the Strong of Saxony, and they were part of a big menagerie that Meissen made big animals for his menagerie. And these are just a few of them. So Meissen was a, was a sort of master porcelain... They were just... They were the first factory that could make white porcelain in Europe. Right. And Augustus actually wanted the, the man who was doing it to, to make gold, but he managed to come up with white porcelain instead. And they are white, very dramatic, but they cracked because they hadn't mastered the art of firing huge pieces. Wow. So they're not because we dropped them. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, th clearly they are huge. I mean, what on earth would you have done with them? Because I mean, you usually get nice little bits of porcelain and put them on your mantelpiece, but there's possibly, no way you could get one of those on. Possibly not in this house. No, we used to display them until quite recently in the very long room upstairs, the saloon. And then a few years ago, they were put away and they've been in our Munim room out of sight for some years. Now we've got them on display here. Now they cause a few problems, I gather, because they're so heavy. They are very heavy, and they fortunately tested the shelves for, shelves for uh, weight before they started because they put big sacks of sand on them, the shelves bent, and... Uh, so uh, if they hadn't tested them, not, this lot would have just... Yes. Oh, so it doesn't bear thinking about. Now, uh, we hope reasonably safe. <laughs> well, it's great to see <laughs> yeah, them here. They are they absolutely mean? magnificent. Although I have to say the elephant... Um, Little odd anatomy, but you little know, strange. Just being a bit picky. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and a strange, and a, and a strange sort of watering can yes. for a trunk. Yes, you could um, perhaps use him for dual purpose. <laughs> Claire, thank you very much. Thank you. Good. We've got lots more coming up on today's program. Up in Wolfwood, the cubs born last year are getting big. We'll find out if they're now eating with the grown-ups. 
Keelan, the python, is a living mystery. He hasn't eaten a thing in over a year. And we'll be there for the historic moment when Romeo and Rosie finally bring their new babies out for the very first time. But now we're going back to the rhino house, where the time has come to do what everyone has been dreading. Babs has been suffering terribly from arthritis. She's in pain, she can't go out, and now she keeps falling over. There's nothing more that vet Duncan Williams can do, so the decision has been taken to put Babs to sleep. As the head keeper for the rhinos, it's up to Tim Yeo to fire the sedative dart. Once the sedative has taken effect, Duncan will administer an overdose of anaesthetic that will stop her heart. Tim covers her eyes to keep her calm. After 13 years, this is the last thing he can do for her. And a moment later, Babs is asleep. Duncan has the anaesthetics ready. It will all be over in just a few seconds. Here, Ray, just hold these two. It's a peaceful end to her suffering. Staff from all over the park have silently slipped in to pay their last respects. The breathing stopped, you know, when we put in the third injection there. I was just making sure there was no heartbeat. I think um, it was safe to say that she's, uh, she's no longer with us. This is probably the worst part of the whole job. Um, the only thing you can think in the back of your mind is it's for her own good. Um, you still don't want to do it because, you know, we've looked after her for 13 years. She's 37 years old. She was in so much pain. And the thing is with, with, with Babs is she likes company. She liked to be stroked. And she was finding that a pain every time you touched her, she was flinching and jumping. Uh, and she wasn't happy. And you've got to put that at the back of your mind and think what's best for her. A lot's gone on the last few seasons up in Wolfwood. In a well-structured wolf pack, it's only the alpha male and the alpha female who are supposed to breed. But for two years, a power struggle raged to determine who would be the top dog. And it was only after that issue was finally resolved that the pack became stable enough to raise young. There were eight cubs last year, born in a den dug under a tree and we certainly enjoyed watching their progress through the spring and summer. But now, as they approach adulthood, what's happened to the status quo? Pack behaviour is most clear when there's food about. I'm out in the wolf enclosure with keeper Bob Trollop, and it's feed time, as you can probably gather. Where should I put this, Bob? Just up here a bit, Kate. I think that'd be fine just right there. Yeah. OK, so they get a sort of whole carcass rather than chunks. They do. It's all to do with the structure of feed. Right. Uh, so the pack can maintain that structure. OK, so we need to get back in now, do we? We do, yep. Right, and let them come towards us. And the van will pull this back a little we'll bit. We'll just pull we? away a little bit and then we can uh, stop and then just watch them. OK. Now, looking at them, you can't really tell. Which were last year's cubs? No, it's very difficult now. Um, they grow so quickly. Probably about 10 months old now. Yeah. All right, Craig. Really big, proper wolf pack, isn't it? It is, yeah. So... All right, mate. When they come in to feed, that's just no one's come in yet, you'd expect dominant male in first? 
Well, you would expect so, but quite often, Ziva, which is the Amiga animal, does get in there first. So the Amiga animal is the lowest in the pack? Is the very lowest. Um, we sometimes think that she gets in there quickly to get as much as she can before it gets chased off. Right. But then the, the dominant animals will come in. Uh, there she is, just there walking by is. it. Yeah, she's uh, she's the one with the floppy, floppy ear. ear. Yeah. yeah, OK. They're just having a sniff. They always seem to check it out before they go in there, just in case it's going to jump up and fight with them or run off. Right. Because yeah. <laughs> they didn't kill it. You know. No, uh, no. Just to be careful. So when you're watching, I mean, how, how has the dynamic changed in the pack since the cubs came along and, and, and obviously now are, to all intents and purposes, adults? Well, it's changed a bit because they've had to integrate into the, the older pack. Right. So they've had to find their place. Yeah. Um, and you do get a bit of squabbling. You, you, you'll notice in a minute that um, when they all get in, tucked in, uh, there'll be a lot of noise, a lot of biting, a lot of scrapping. But it's all to do with intimidation more than anything. The dominant male last year was... Two tips. Two tips. Yeah, and he still is the, the alpha male. Right, so OK. Um, and how can you tell that? I mean, can you tell that from, from looking at the feed? Uh, quite often in a huddle like that, yeah, and, you know, you can tell if... Look for the tails, and if the tails are high, then that's quite a high-ranking animal. Oh. Uh, and he will... You can see his tails right up compared to the others. Uh, and also, he will go over and he will intimidate. He will jump on them. He will stand over the top of them. Right. Um, and if he's doing his job properly, then they will submit to him. They will cower. Right, OK. And the way the pack works is that there is always one dominant male and one dominant female. Yeah, always. Um, and then it will extend the, the ladder to the lowest. Right. Um, now, last year, Frida was your, your top uh, yeah. female no, top dog. Female, yeah. um, again, is there a sign of change this year, or do you think she's still hanging in there? She, no, she's still top dog. Right. Um, uh, you know, we've just come out of their, their breeding season where they've been mating. Yeah. And she's been doing everything right. She's been intimidating the other females, like Ziva, and yeah. there's another young female that is at breeding age. Um, and she's been going around there when there's been any interest by the males with these other ones. She's getting in there and she's actually, you know, laying down the law. Go away, get right. out of this, you know. Um, if you're going to breed, you're going to breed with me, sort of thing. Absolutely. I mean, this is a great opportunity, presumably, for you to, to really study any changing dynamics within the pack. This ideal time is on feed-up, um, because you actually all see them all at one go. And also to see how, how well they are. How absolutely, they are. absolutely. I and mean, presumably if a wolf isn't feeding or is... I mean, you can see whether they're injured or limping at this particular... Well, yeah, this is very true. You know, we know that the fact that those two youngsters are uh, subordinates, right. so they, they won't come in until we're right out of the way. Yeah. Um, but they will get something to eat. It doesn't mean that they're, they're going to starve. Um, but in the hierarchy of things, you know, they're not worthy to go in there yet. It's fantastic to see them. It's amazing. They're all tussling over one small bit. <laughs> Ziva, a clever girl. <laughs> she may be the only right, dog, yeah. <laughs> but here she is with a whole bit to herself. Great. Well, Bob, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's great to see them flourishing. It's been over 30 years since there were last otter pups in Pet's Corner. Then, seven weeks ago, Rosie gave birth deep inside her den. And there the baby stayed, hidden away until now. This is the very first footage taken by the keepers when Rosie and Romeo brought their new family out of the den for the very first time. The head of Pet's Corner, Darren Beasley, is delighted. We've seen them at last. Um, I know exactly how many there are. There are, in here behind me, two baby otters. Um, and looking at the mess, look at this, they put all their shavings in their water bottle, it's disgusting. They're two very playful otters as well. They look very healthy, uh, they're like perfect little miniatures of, of mum and dad. In fact, they've got pink noses, just like mum, so they're, I don't know if they're boys or girls, so I'm just getting a bit excited now, but um, they're just so wonderful and they look really healthy. So we know there's two. Uh, I've had a bit of a rummage, I know there's, there's uh, no brothers and sisters squashed or anything horrible under there, so it's all, all gone well. Um, two babies born, two babies being reared, perfectly healthy and one happy keeper. But it was a week before the proud parents went completely public and brought their babies all the way into the outdoor enclosure. 
Luckily, keeper Rob Savin was there with his camcorder to get these shots. Mum and Dad were actually doing the job. They were bringing... Mum was dragging them by the neck. It looked a bit brutal, but Mum was dragging them by the neck and, and bringing them on out. And, um, and they were having a little explore. Um, we, we were here for hours, just, just, just in amazement, really. It was fantastic. Um, and then she'd, she'd drag them back in again. So it was almost like, you've had your time outside now, ch children, you know, time to go in. Um, and they went back in again. But since then, they've been able to sort of leap up themselves. We've helped them out a little bit, and, and they've been coming out as and when now. These are Asian short-clawed otters one of the few species of otter that will naturally live in extended family groups. So there's no reason why the youngsters shouldn't stay here indefinitely. Although both pups appear to be growing normally, Darren spotted a problem. It could be serious. We've got a little bit of concern about um, one of our two brand spanking new baby otters. Um, we've been delighted to see them out over the last couple of days, but when you look really, really close at them, um, the back end of one of the babies, where, where the, the bottom joins the tail, uh, there's quite a bit of what looks like hair loss or, or parting of the hair. Um, it might be nothing, but I think it's worth the vet having a look. The, certainly all the keepers have had a look, and we all agree it doesn't look right. Um, it could be mum over-grooming. It could be an over-attentive mum. Um, and I've seen her pick them up. She grabs them up by the back of the neck, you know, and, and off she goes. Perhaps she picked them up by the back end by mistake. Um, but it could be a tick or a parasite, internal parasite. Um, it could be the, something annoying the baby down there. Um, so we've got to investigate it. We've waited so long to get this right. We want it right. We don't want anything to go wrong now. Um, and we might be new parents over worrying about, you know, worrying about something that's nothing really. Um, but I think it's best to get a, a second opinion. We'll get the vet and let him have a look. They may be in captivity, but the otters are kept as though they're wild. So it will be difficult to get a closer look. They're not tame animals. They are, in fact, very, very dangerous. I mean, their teeth and their bite is designed for going through shell and bone, so it's very, very powerful. Uh, would do a, a human being a lot of damage. So there's a safety of the keepers, but with the babies, if we handle them now, it might ruin all our good work. It might be that they'll smell of humans, that mum and dad will get distressed or upset. Um, it might even be that they begin to accept humans too much, the babies, and, and become very tame. We, we don't want any of that. But obviously, like every animal, if need must, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a rhinoceros or a, an otter or a little, little cockroach, sometimes you do have to handle things for, for reasons, and, and we have the system in place that we will grab them and, and handle them uh, if we have to. We'll be back when the vet arrives to find out if Darren is being overprotective or if the little pup's problem is something far more serious. Elsewhere in Pet's Corner is a creature with a rather surprising problem. In fact, it's amazing he's still alive. This is Keelan, the royal python, and he hasn't eaten a single thing in over a year. I'm with Sarah Clayson. We're in the hot house at Pet's Corner. Sarah, is this normal behaviour for a royal python? Um, it can happen quite often, actually, yeah, um, especially because he was donated to us by someone. Mm -hmm. And when they first get into a new environment, they can take a time to adjust to right. it. So and it was nearly a year ago, was it, that he came here? It was roughly about a year ago now, yeah. So, so it's yeah. almost like extreme homesickness where, where you just haven't adapted to your new environment. Yeah, basically he's getting used to the new kind of heat and the new lighting and um, he was in with a new group of snakes as mm -hmm. well. So it's just all of those factors that contribute to the fact that he was just a little bit put off of his food and then it just take a while to, to get back into it, basically. And it amazes me that a, a snake can actually survive for that long without food. How can they do it? Well, actually, the, the royal pythons, they only actually have to eat once a week, whilst well, mm -hmm. when we offer our food. They don't eat that often at all. Um, because they don't need to eat that often, we do because we have to burn our food to keep ourselves warm, but obviously snakes are cold-blooded, so they move around their environment to heat themselves up. Mm -hmm. So they don't actually have to food, have food that often. Okay. And if you've got quite a large snake, they can actually afford to lose a bit of body fat that they've actually stored, but it's when they're a bit smaller that's a bit worrying because obviously they haven't got the the reserves there to use up, so... Of course. Now, um, has he got his appetite back? 
He has, yeah. We um, offered him some food as we normally do every week about three weeks ago. And what actually happened is he, he struck for the food but actually missed and got one of our keeper's hands. So, yeah, I know. He bit someone. Yeah, he did. Did he draw blood? <laughs> a little bit. I don't <laughs> think he meant it though. Basically, what it was, royals are really non aggressive snakes. They're very mm -hmm. laid back and very docile. And the keeper um, put the food down and tried to move him back into his tank because he was kind of coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And he got a little bit confused. He sensed the heat from our hands and right. the movement because they haven't got that great eyesight. And he just went and um, caught our so hands. You really yeah. do think it was just an accident, do you? I do, yeah. I don't think it was calculated at all. <laughs> but perhaps that was what um, it kind of instigated the return of his appetite. It could have, yeah. It could have very well done. But I think the fact that he struck for it in the first place meant that he was ready to actually mm -hmm. have some food. So if you really do think it was an accident, can I... Um, yeah, you can, can I, yeah. Can I hold him? He's quite good at the moment. He's just wrapped himself into a little ball, so... I am sort of used to your snakes here in Pets Corner, but there is something a little bit unnerving about them, even now. Yeah, I'm a lot sure of what people it is. share that thought. I think, um, basically, snakes and other animals, a lot of them only bite if they feel threatened or right. afraid. And because royals are of, of the nature that they're very laid back and they don't mind being handled, mm -hmm. they've really got no need to bite unless they're really, really provoked. Mm -hmm. but, and they don't tend to bite anything that's too big for them to eat because it's, they see it as just a waste of energy. And I think I'm probably just a little a bit little too bit. large yeah, for, um, for Keelan to eat me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. Interesting, yeah. Sarah, shall I pass him back to Please you? Let's take him again. <laughs> you are quite sweet, really. I suppose, in a sneaky sort of way. Yeah, he's all right, actually, this one. Sarah, thank you very much. That's all right. It's been a couple of days since Babs had to be put to sleep. Up at the Rhino House, the routine has to go on, though everyone is finding it hard to adjust to the fact that she's no longer here. In the house, you know, she, she was always... She took up a whole pen. She's quite a, a large rhino. She took up a whole pen. Um, and now it's, it's a big empty space. I was just doing their feeds now and I was looking around for Babs' food bucket. I don't know what you're doing, you know, so... If, if something kicked off, Babs was, was always pretty quiet. She'd calm it down pretty quick. Um, she wouldn't let the, the others go too far. It's going to take a long time for it all to sink in and, and realise she's not going to be there when you open the door. But you never replace Babs, no. No, you can't replace her. She's had an extremely good innings in, in the wild, around 15, between 15 and 20, they say, is a, a very good age for a rhino, you know, because they live quite a rough life out and about. She's done exceptionally well. Um, so, you know, we're very pleased on that front that she's had a good long, um, and, and on the whole, a very good life here at Longley. But this isn't the end of everything in the rhino house. For Ian Turner, it's time to look forward. What we've got to do now is put our minds onto something in the future, focus on something different, so it literally cheers us up in a way. Um, and the, now the outlook is that the, hopefully that the young ones will start mating this year um, because they've got to the right age, and then two years down the lines, there's no reason why we should have baby rhinos. Amongst the treasures of Longleat House, there are many precious objects of historical interest. In fact, almost every item has a story to tell. I'm in the Great Hall with house steward Ken Windus, and we're looking at this absolutely magnificent table, Ken. It's just the most extraordinary piece of furniture. It certainly is, yeah. It's a, a shuffleboard table. They used to play the old uh, game of shuffle, shove eight me on it. Right. Um, it's 33 feet long. Wow. Originally, the planks were one from one end to the other. It's just stretched from one end so, to the other. So there would have been no joins in the planks there at all? There would have been no joins at all. There are joins in it now because, obviously, over the years, it's been repaired, etc., yeah. etc. And why was it important not to have any joins? Well, obviously, if you, if you hit the coin, yeah. it needed to go as far as possible, which was the object of the game. OK. And if there was a join, it would have probably either jumped the coin or, or simply stopped it. So it would have ruined the game. So that would have been one tree, top to bottom? That's right. It came from the estate. It was built from the estate timber. What, what sort of wood? It's oak wood. Right. Um, it's built actually in the hall because it's too long to get through doors. I was going to say, I mean, how on earth could you have got it in? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it was built in, in here. Tree. Yeah. And it's presumably it has to be a permanent job. fixture now. You can That's never right. get it out. We're, we're, if you like, stuck with it being there. 
um, which is a good thing in a way because it means that uh, you know it gets preserved. Absolutely. And and the design, just looking down at, at, at these parts here. I mean, is that because I would have thought, looking at it, that it was a banqueting table, that it wasn't a, a games yeah. table. Does this sort of give it away? This sort of design. It does here? because, of course, if you sat at it, you couldn't get your knees underneath because of, of the course. rails, etc. Yeah. Um, these these arches are actually an addition. They were put in probably 200 years ago. Right. Um, but the actual, a bit modern then. That's right. Yeah, a bit of, uh, <laughs> modern stuff there, yeah. Um, but the legs and the in the rails themselves are original. It's a just amazing, amazing piece of craftsmanship mm -hmm. as well, isn't it? It certainly is. And, and these here... These are the actual coins. Right. Um, they're not actual coins that you would have spent. They were actually made for the... Uh, for the Game. So they're sort of like posh tiddlywinks. If you like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they are silver. Yeah. And as you can see underneath, they're actually made aerodynamic, so that you, the actual rim is only the, the oh, part that actually right. touches the table. And so they could almost skim like a hovercraft. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've seen these games at the fair. You can play that hover across the yeah. tabletop. Yeah. But you can see there, they're actually numbered. And yeah. each one has got a different number, as well as a different design. So that each player, of course, knew what, which what, one, which piece which was one theirs. Went. Did you flick them like tiddlywinks? Or, no. Or? If I can show you here. Yeah. Um, you actually place them on the end of the table here. Yeah. Right? And you'd have hit the coin. Yeah. And that would have obviously projected the coin up the table. Can I have a quick go? I'm afraid not. No, I mean, it, it, <laughs> too too it, valuable. It, it is, yeah. All right. Um, it's very tempting, I must admit. It is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean, the object of the game was to obviously get the, get the coin as far as it could possibly go. Right. And it actually fallen off the table. I can imagine it being quite an addictive game, actually. Yeah, but that's, there's a lot of money lost in, in one on it. Um, so people would bet on it. It would be like a, right. a, like playing poker or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And I, I do believe that Henry VIII was um, into it. Oh, I think, really? I think he, he really so got it was into a, it. So yeah. it, was, it was very much a kind yeah. of aristocratic game, exactly, if you yeah. like. Yeah. And it's... I think there was a law brought out where they actually stopped the playing of it because a lot of people spent too much time playing it rather than <laughs> working. Around, around <laughs> well, I can see why I'm absolutely desperate to have a go. <laughs> You're going to have to take me out of here, Ken, before I do. Thank you very, very much indeed. That is fascinating. You're welcome. Wow, look at that. Back in Pet's Corner, one of the two baby otters has a mysterious problem. The pup is losing hair from the base of its tail. So now Darren Beasley has called in the vet Duncan Williams to take a look. How safe is it? Yeah. Not really, no. They're, they're quite feisty. Are they? Mm. You haven't handled them? Eh? No, not at all. I mean, it looks like the outer hair loss, to be honest, has just been being, you know, over-groomed or, or um, rubbed on something. But it's just weird because it's localised just to the back end yeah. and that we don't see them do it. Catching and handling the baby would be extremely stressful for the youngster and Duncan doesn't want to rush into drastic action. The first remedy to try is the simplest. When they're out next time, is it possible to change all the litter? Yeah, definitely. We, we, definitely. we can do that. Yeah. Give it a really good clean, eh? So, a little later, when the family is out, Bev Allen moves in for a spring clean to get rid of anything that might be irritating the baby's skin. It's quite important to keep this nice and clean, um, just in case um, if they had lice or um, fleas or anything like that, we have to disinfect it out. Bev's been watching the youngsters closely, and the baby's skin problem hasn't affected its behaviour at all. They sort of come out with mum and dad, um, usually um, sort of talk for food to us. And then once they've had enough, they go back in. Um, and then w when they want to come back out again, they go back out. So they're getting quite mobile now, um, but they haven't been in the water yet. So we've still got to wait for that. A couple of days later, it looks like the spring clean may well have done the trick. We've basically been monitoring the tail now uh, for several days uh, and we had all the hair loss at the base of, of, of the tail uh, and we were going to grab the poor little baby and do skin scrapes and things um, and in fact it's got no worse, um, which is all good news. Um, the baby's looking very, very healthy, um, it's eating, it's following mum and dad around, it's doing everything the other baby does um, and we now actually think it's probably um, just a scruffy baby. They've got to be the most wonderful animals on the planet. They're always active, so cute. Hello, come to say hello. Hello. 
How are you? Jason and I have come down to Pet's Corner with keeper Hello. Rob Savin to meet three of Longleat's seven parrots. So who, who have we got here, Rob? We've got Jake with you. Yep. I've got Cheeky Archie on my shoulder. And we've got Matilda with Kate there. One, the one-legged Matilda. She's, <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, she's showing off. There, but... I mean, is, is that a word? I mean, you, they do a sort of performance here, yeah. don't they? Yeah, they do, yeah. And um, they are known for being incredibly intelligent. Is that They're right? Very intelligent. They do like to show off. And obviously, they've all got characters. This one is particularly <laughs> um, cheeky and naughty. He likes to get into everything and break everything. Matilda, she's a little bit of, of a boffin. She's a very intelligent bird. She's particularly quiet as far as... Um, I mean, parrots are very noisy, but yeah. as far as a parrot goes, she's one of the quiet ones. And this one here? Ja Jake, he's, Jake, he's very thoughtful, he's very intelligent as well. I think they're, they're all very, very intelligent, but they've just got different characters and uh, and uh, they do different things within the, within the show. Matilda was showing off there. She's given a, I don't know if she'll give a little wave for the... For the oh, yeah. Does Archie say anything? <laughs> he does. They can all copy and mimic different noises, and it can be sometimes actions as well. Parrots and mimic all sorts of things. And Archie's got a nice hello. I don't know if we're going to hear it. Hello. Oh, he has. But I... uh, sometimes we get a chuckle. <laughs> Good boy. There we go. Matilda, well, not really any vocalizations. We might get a little uh, a little wave again. We can try another wave, Matilda. Good girl. There we go. And Jake, and Jake he's actually he's got just a, very intelligent. He's got a nice goodbye sometimes. Has he? Let's try it. <laughs> oh, there we go. Perfect. Very well, well timed, done. Jake. Well done, Jake. They are brilliant. Well, Rob, thank you very much. You're very I welcome. think on Jake's goodbye, that is all we've got time for on today's programme. But here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. His real mother rejected him, so this little baby wallaby needs round the clock care and a substitute pouch. Samba, the gorilla, is in her twilight years and now she's fallen dangerously ill. And Lord Bath dishes the dirt on his great, 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 great grandfather. It's a tragic tale of skullduggery, murder and a ghost with a broken heart. So don't miss the next Animal Park.